I think this is the longest video that we've watched or are about to watch by Fat Electrician to date. Okay. Old age and treachery. The unstoppable 77th Infantry Division. Let's check it. A lot of you probably already know the name Desmond Doss, and even more of mm -hmm. you would remember it if I reminded you that he was a conscientious objector in World War II that refused to carry a weapon into combat. Despite that, he saved 75 men at Hacksaw Ridge as a medic. Uh -huh. But what almost none of you have heard of is the experimental unit that he was a part of. <laughs> Today we're talking Which about the 77th in Infantry Division, a.k.a. the Old Bastards. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, whether you realize it or not, we've all been exposed to the concept that you should never underestimate the old guy because sometimes he just might be a complete badass. Mm -hmm. We see it everywhere. There's memes and commonly held sayings all over the internet like youth and exuberance is no match for old age and treachery or beware an old man in a profession where young men die. And if that wasn't enough in pop culture... I like that one. Beware of an old man in a profession where young men die. He's old because he hasn't died yet. Because he's a tough son of a bitch. In TV, there are characters in pretty much every show and every movie that are the embodiment of this sentiment, and they are more often than not the fan favorite that everybody loves. On Nickelodeon, a kid's channel, you see characters like Uncle Iroh and King Boomy. In anime, you see characters like Master Roshi. In more adult shows, you've got characters like Mike from Breaking Bad, Lloyd from Yellowstone, and Sir Barristan from Game of Thrones. Characters like this are everywhere in pop culture, and they are catered to every age group because it is never too early to learn the simple concept concept of be careful because that old man just might whoop your fucking ass mm -hmm. and i bring all this up because it raises one simple question <laughs> if old men really are such badasses and experience is truly such a valuable asset what would happen if you made an entire army out of old guys well we don't have to wonder because in world war ii america did just that have fun giving them orders trying to anyway and the results speak for themselves and we're going to get into it right after a word from our sponsor this video is brought to you by henson's shaving okay here's the deal henson's is a family-owned machine shop that makes parts for the aerospace industry there's literally parts yes i have seen sicario fantastic on the mars rover that these guys made and one day they woke up and they're like hey we're just going to make the most precise safety razor on the market and this is I've been making pro-American history videos on the internet for about two years now, and without fail, every single time I make a video about America and World War II, I get this exact keyboard warrior in the comment section. Buh! America didn't win World War II. They showed up late and tried to take credit for it. Buh! Okay, look, on one hand, I want to give this a serious answer. There's no American that's saying America won World War II all by themselves. Nobody is saying that. It was a huge team effort by the big three, America, the UK, and the USSR, as well as a bunch of other countries that were occupied or close to being occupied. Mm -hmm. They all made humongous sacrifices to win World War II. And contributions. Two, it was a massive team effort. So when an American says America won World War II, they're simply saying the Allied forces won, America is part of the Allied forces, therefore America won. It is a factually correct statement. Just And if one of the other big three wants to say the same thing, no one's going to correct them. We're on the same team. It's like it would also be a factually correct statement to say that the USSR and the UK also won World War II. Exactly. On the other hand, if we're talking shit, I can do that too, because guess what? <laughs> when it comes to World Wars, America's the MVP. I hate to break it to you, but let's just face facts here. If World War III breaks out tomorrow and we're picking teams by lining all the countries up on the wall like it's dodgeball in gym class, guess who's getting picked first? America. If you disagree with that, it's because you're being disingenuous or you're fucking dumb. And the whole America showed up late to World War II thing, look, number one seed in the tournament gets to buy don't hit the player hit the game <laughs> furthermore it's not like world war ii was on the verge of ending and america popped in at the last second so they could be on the winning team okay world war ii ended because america came off the fucking top rope with yeah. aircraft carriers sherman tanks and atomic bombs sorry i'm getting horribly sidetracked i apologize the point i'm trying to get to is that there's a lot of people on the internet that like to say america showed up late to world war ii but the fact of the matter is it's not like america had a choice that was literally the only option because in 1939 when world war ii kicked off america didn't really have 
have a military to go fight with. Okay, let me break this down for you. 16 million Americans served in the military in World War II, and at its peak, the US military had 12 million people actively serving in it. In 1939, when World War II started, America's military had 200,000 people in the army and 100,000 people in the Navy. To put that into perspective, America had the That's... 19th largest military on the planet. I was about to say, that is not a lot. was Portugal, which is approximately the size of Indiana, which is one of America's 50 states. And if that wasn't bad enough, not only was the American military small, it also just wasn't very good at this point in time mm -hmm. either. They were so underfunded that the American military only had 329 light tanks that were outdated and 1,800 aircraft that were also outdated. And if that wasn't bad enough, not only did they not have good equipment and there wasn't very many of them, they didn't really know how to fight either because America hadn't revisited its battle doctrine since World War One, meaning the only fight that America knew how to participate in was trench warfare, which was On the ground. not what World War Two was. No. So if America wants to have a meaningful impact in World War Two, they're going to have to rebuild an entire military from the ground up, both physically and conceptually. So the American government and the American military got to work on this right away in 1939 because they knew America was going to have to participate in this war, whether the public wanted to or not. Mm -hmm. And hint, the American public wanted absolutely nothing to do with World War II from 1939 through 1941. At this point in time, the American public very much viewed World War II as a European conflict that America had no business getting involved with, and they wanted nothing to do with it. This started to institute a draft in October of 1940, forcing young men into the military to grow its military size just in case. Fast forward about a year, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, committing the cardinal sin of fucking with America's boats, essentially flipping the American public sentiment of we don't want to be involved to cowabunga it is. In less than 24 hours on December 8th, 1941, the American government, Congress, has officially declared war on Japan. Three days after that, December 11th, Hitler declares war on America, at which point all of America is pretty much like, I mean, you didn't touch the boats, but fuck it, you can get some too. It's a bold strategy, Congress. See if it pays off for them. And in the days and weeks and months following the attack on Pearl Harbor, not only have hundreds of thousands of young men volunteered to join the United States military, but the draft would ramp up as well. The army was growing so much so fast that they were activating and standing up new divisions left and right, one mm -hmm. after another. And by March of 1942, these new divisions that were being stood up were almost entirely comprised of draftees. They had some officers and some NCOs that were assigned to stand up the entire division, but aside from that, all of the new guys that were coming in were all untrained new recruits that were drafted. Yes, Canada did fight in World War II. However, it wasn't... <sighs> see if I can remember this correctly. They did have troops in World War II. Canada did. Was it to the same effect and the same grandiose amount that we had? In World War II? No, but they did have soldiers that fought in World War II. From what I can remember, uh, feel free to fact check me or Google it, but I believe they did, yes. And one of these first all drafty divisions was the 77th Infantry Division. Now, I need you to understand how absolutely crazy this situation is. Standing up a new division is a humongous undertaking, mm -hmm. okay? A military unit of that size, that's like 15,000 men. That is a living, breathing entity, okay? There's history, there's standard operating procedures, there's leadership, there's a way of doing things, and that way has probably been written in blood for years by the men that came before you, and you're just popping one up overnight, okay? That's fucking crazy. Okay, let me explain explain this in a hypothetical so hopefully you can understand a little bit better okay? it's like it'd be like it'd be like building the city of atlanta in a day kind of not as very many people but back in these times fifteen thousand troops in a division just boom there it just it's there it'd be like be like building a city like LA or New York City or Atlanta or uh, Dallas, Texas. It'd be like building that in a week, kind of, I feel. Let's see. Okay, imagine that you showed up to work tomorrow. Let's say that you, you worked on an assembly line for Ford and you're building F-150s and you showed up to work and they gave you and a couple of your buddies that you work with keys and they're like, hey, drive across town 
there's a big ass empty building. I need you to go ahead and start another manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. There's no machines. Figure out the machines you need, figure out what order they need to go in, figure out the new fucking car that you're gonna build mm -hmm. and figure out all of this shit, how you're gonna pay everybody, By taxes, yourself. everything. Figure all of it out. By the way, the new workforce is coming in next week. None of them are fucking trained. You have to go ahead and train them on all the shit that you haven't even figured out yourself yet. Good luck. And if that wasn't hard enough, the 77th Infantry Division was a guinea pig division. It was literally an experiment. You see, the see high ranking military goes. and the government were concerned, and they didn't know what it was going to take to win World War II, and they didn't know if they had enough young men, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. What if all of those young men got taken out, and we needed to rely on the older generation of men to go fight this war? They needed to know what these older men in their 30s and 40s and 50s would of. be capable of physically doing on the battlefield. And they needed to get that data now so they had it in the future should they need it. So when they comprised the 77th Infantry Division, they basically gave them all of the old guys. Okay, the average age of a draftee in 1942 was 23 years old. The average age of somebody in the 77th ID was 33 years old. Oof. And bear in mind, that's the average. The oldest new recruit I could find in the 77th Infantry Division was 53 years old, Damn. and he was a World War I veteran. And some of you are probably <sighs> like, yeah, 53 is pretty old, but 33 isn't that old at all. Why mm -hmm. are you making a big deal about this? Okay, look, as far as joining the military at the age of 33, that's ancient. That's almost unheard of. But, but it happens, ladies and gentlemen. When I went to basic training back in 2009, there was a man in my basic training who was 40 years old. I think I've told you guys this before, and y'all probably remember, he was 40 years old, private. And I looked at him and I said, what the fuck, dog? He's like, I know what you're going to say. He was a police officer for 20 years, 20 years as a police officer. And instead of retiring with his pension, going to some fucking golf club, maybe spending some time on the beach, maybe uh, picking up a hobby or just chilling out, he decided, fuck it, I'm not doing anything at the moment. Let's go ahead and join the army. And he did at 40 years old. He was a really good guy too. He was really nice. I mean, think about it. You can join the military at 17 years old, be done, and have 20 years in service with a full pension at 37, 38 years old, and these guys are joining at 33. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I went through basic and AIT, the oldest guy we had was my buddy Flores. He was 28 years old, and everybody called him Gray Bush the Wise. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to get across to you is like, yeah, it's really weird to join the military that late in life, but also, it's a good kind of weird because every person that's been in the military ever, if you came up to them and asked them, hey, if you had to go off to war, Every person that's been in the military ever, if you came up to them and asked them, hey, if you had to go off to war and you could either go with a platoon of 18 year old kids or a platoon of 30 year old men, everybody's picking the 30 year old, -old men a hundred percent of the mm -hmm. time. Because you got to realize when these 18, 19, 20 year old new recruits are coming in for training, half the battle is having the army, the drill instructors come in and teach these kids all the life lessons that mommy and daddy never got around to mm -hmm. while they were growing up as kids. They don't have to do that with a bunch of 30 year old men. These yeah. guys have been out with the 18 and 19 year olds you have to unfuck 18 years worth of bad behavior bad habits and that stupid little fucking god complex that most 18 year olds have and when you're dealing with 30 plus year old dudes uh, they don't really they don't really operate that way however they have the wisdom the knowledge strength and the patience so yeah i'm taking that every single every single time out in the real world for 15 years getting their asses whooped by life and eating shit sandwiches they're already with the program yeah i am very humbly asking if you could chip in five ten or even 25 dollars i know that time no donald you're a billionaire i like you but you're a billionaire so the 77th ID shows up to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. That's 16 weeks and then another 12 weeks for their- Wait, what was it called back in the day? With the program. So the 77th ID shows up to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Ah, Fort Jackson, it's been, okay. Carolina for basic- Fort Jackson, to this day, if I can remember correctly, is 
Oh, I think they I think they all are now, except for Fort Benning. I, I, I still think it's all dudes at Fort Benning. Maybe. Is it, they allow women into the infantry now, right? Can't fuck remember. But when I went through basic training, I went through Fort Knox, and Fort Knox was an all-male basic training. There were no females. But to this day, and even when I served, Fort Jackson was... And is male and female basic training. Back in these times, it's probably all dudes, though. <laughs> Guaranteed. Training, that's 16 weeks, and then another 12 weeks for their advanced training. Oh, so they had, they had OSET training. One station, one unit. Which, for most of them, is just going to be infantry. And they absolutely crush it. They show up, and there's very little, like, disciplinary... Probably wasn't called OSET back then, but that's what it... Yeah, that's what it is. My dad was OSET. Oh... Uh... Fort Sill. You do your basic training and your AIT at the same place. <sighs> your life lessons being handed out by the drill sergeants because, well, they're older than most of the drill sergeants. It's mm -hmm. literally a bunch of middle-aged men showing up, being like, okay, I'm here. Show me what I got to do to not die. Mm -hmm. And then whenever somebody was being an asshole, they would police themselves. Like one of the new recruits is being a dick. All the other new recruits would handle that issue internally before it even got to the drill sergeants Perfect. because they wanted everybody squared away. Mm -hmm. So fast forward two months, they are on week eight out of the 16 for basic training, and they are head and shoulders above all the other new training divisions. They are the best division they have. They are so good that when Winston Churchill came over from England halfway through their basic training, they were the unit that was selected to do a parade for nice. Winston Churchill to show off how badass the American Some good honors. Be. And here's what Winston Churchill Hill had to say about it. Quote, the faces of the men gave me the greatest and everlasting memory of the day. I have never been more impressed than I was with the bearing of the men whom I saw. The undemonstrative, therefore grim determination of the newly drafted bodies bodes ill for our enemies. Mm -hmm. So this experimental guinea pig unit of old guys is absolutely crushing it. They go on, they finish basic training. I don't have the exact stats, but it is documented that a disproportionately high amount of all of the 70 7th Infantry, qualified as expert with the M1 Grand right out of basic training. From there, they go and they do their 12 weeks of advanced training, and they do a great job at that, too. At this point, upper military is kind of looking at these guys like, okay, well, this is this is actually kind of working. Let's mm -hmm. see what these old guys can really do. So they send them down to Louisiana for eight weeks, and they're going to do a war game, the 77th ID going up against another new division that just got stood up, full of 23-year-olds. Literally, the old guys versus the new guys, youth and exuberance versus old age and treachery. We're going to have a legit war game and see who outperforms the other. And when I tell you the 77th ID whooped that other division's fucking ass, it is a complete understatement. Oh my god, I almost died! <laughs> I almost died! I was so scared! Okay, now at this point, it's winter in Louisiana. It's gonna be cold at night, especially yep. considering they're not allowed to have tents and they're not allowed to have fires. They're just out there sleeping on the ground for two months Roughing doing it. this war game, going force <sighs> against force. So, naturally, the 77th ID wants to play the mental warfare game and ruin it right out of the gate for these young kids. So bearing in mind that it's winter and everybody's going to be cold at night, the 77th launches a bunch of very aggressive ambush attacks, basically pinning the other force between them and a river, and they just keep advancing closer and closer until the other division is forced to cross the river on foot, getting all of their shit completely soaked. Okay, and some of you are probably like, oh, they got a little bit wet. Who cares? Trust me. If you were living outside for two months and every possession that you owned to your name was on your back in a backpack and you weren't allowed to have a tent or Fucking fire to dry your sucks. clothes and all your shit just got soaked, you would care. Okay, sucks. there's nothing worse than walking around for 16 hours holding a gun with a heavy backpack on and the only comfort you get at the end of the day is some dehydrated food and the opportunity to change out your wet socks. And did he mention that it's already freezing? and cold, and you're wet? Ugh. That just adds a whole nother layer of this shit fucking blows, man. It really does. For more wet socks. Okay, whether you believe me or not, I just need you to trust me. It's going to take a mental toll yes. on some 18, 19, 20 yes. year old kids. Believe me. Mm -hmm. And from there, it only gets like a thousand times worse. I keep reiterating this, but you got to remember these are middle aged men, okay? These are dudes that are working construction jobs yeah. in the 1940s before OSHA was around. Walking around on I beams with no harnesses, eating Ugh. lunch, and nobody gives a shit. You got dudes that were working in offices before they had an HR department, okay? These guys are bringing so much workplace pranks 
and tomfoolery to the table. These 20-year-olds aren't going to know what they can't handle. So one of the big things the 77th does is they start pretending to be in this other division at <laughs> night. Like, they'll roll up at night. There's, like, one guy left awake, you know, pulling guard duty, whatever. They'll roll up to him and be like, hey, uh, commander so-and-so, whatever the fuck said, I need to take this Jeep and go take it over to HQ, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, sure, go yeah, ahead. whatever, man. He, like, nods back off of sleep while he's supposed to be on guard. 77th ID guy just steals Dumbass. their Jeep. I mean, strategically transfers it to a different location. Like, they're stealing all their vehicles. They're stealing all their equipment. And yep. then, you know, usually when you're doing military stuff, you want to sever enemies' communications so they can... And you're probably thinking, well, why did they have to do that? It's just war games. What do you think the enemy is going to try to do to you? The enemy is going to do way worse. So... It just goes back to the whole thing of like basic training where they just got to break you down to build you back up, bro. If you can't take getting yelled at by a fucking drill sergeant, you are not going to survive combat. If you can't take one dude in your face screaming at you and that just makes you sad or makes you want to quit or it's too hard or it's too overbearing and your, your brain can't just take it. You can be in combat, bro. Combat is so much harder than just like one dude screaming in your face with that one vein popping out of his fucking neck and his forehead. What do you think the enemy's gonna do? Way worse. You know, so. Can't communicate at all. Not the 77th ID. No, we've got fucking Jimmy who worked for the phone company for 10 years. We're gonna find the enemy communication lines, mm -hmm. we're gonna tap into them, and then we're just gonna start feeding them bad intel to make complete fucking <laughs> chaos behind enemy lines. And then all the boys are gonna gather around the radio at night, and we're all gonna listen to the higher ups. And, and hey, those kids are better off for it. Because once they deploy, there's nothing you can do to surprise them. Like, oh, we've seen this before. Them fucking old bastards got us with this same trick a couple months ago. Not again. They're better. They're better off for this. Their chain of command complain about how poorly they're performing. <laughs> At the conclusion of this war game, the 77th ID has just completely outclassed this other division full of young men, and it really starts raising some eyebrows because now people really want to know what these old guys are physically capable of doing. Everyone thinks they want to know what a soldier is capable of until they actually see what he's capable of, and they're just like, oh, oh no, 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 I, that, that, that can't stand, yeah, bullshit. And this is where it goes from being kind of fun to not fun at all for the 77th ID because the real experiments are about to begin. They send the entire 77th to a place called Camp Hyder. It's about 100 miles outside of Phoenix, Arizona. In uh, at least they got 10. Uh, that's probably not a real photo. Maybe. I'm not sure. But, ugh. Looks just like Afghanistan. Yeah the middle of the desert so they show up to camp hider it's literally just the desert with a couple of tents not even enough tents for the entire division they have to yeah, at least they got tents go and dig their own wells to find their own water mm -hmm. and then because they didn't have enough tents they're out there literally building mud huts to live in so after they get done literally building an army base from scratch the army comes along and they're like hey we want to know how far a normal dude can march in the desert in 100 degree heat if we only give him one quart of water so here's what you guys are going to do we're going to force you to march and you're just going to keep marching until a certain number of you Pass, pass the out. fuck out. That way, we'll have a really good idea of how far a single dude can go on one quart of water. So this is already borderline cruel and unusual Woo! punishment, but it doesn't stop there because after they figure out how far a guy can go on a single quart of water, they decide that they're going to start having six-day exercises where they have the second lieutenant, the lowest-ranking officer that presumably knows the least, guide a platoon of... <laughs> oh, it's not presumably. <laughs> they know the absolute fucking least. <laughs> At least in my day in the fucking service, holy shit. And through the desert for six days straight. And if they want to be able to get their next day's supply of water and food, they, they got to make it to the, the right place to at the, the next right checkpoint time at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they just don't get the food and water. Yeah. You thirsty, Stanley? Okay, they're literally doing some hunger. That right there is sufficient motivation to get the job done. It really is games shit with their own troops and for those of you that don't know it's literally a running joke in the military that lieutenants suck at land navigation and always get lost there's literally men that die from exposure and dehydration during this period at camp hider from the 77th infantry division and this goes on for six months that the 77th is out in the middle of the desert you gotta weed out the week having experiments run on sounds them. terrible but it's a world war man 
And after that six month war period month period came to an end and they got orders saying they were going to move on to some other type of training. They decided that in true military fashion, they were going to put this behind them by utilizing a dark sense of humor. The joke was that their time in the desert was just as shitty as we're really good at that. <laughs> actually going to war so they came up with their own medal the Hyder campaign medal to commemorate their time in the desert that they would all wear on their uniforms as a joke the ribbon of the medal was made out of a piece of sandpaper and the medal itself was a broken thermometer and to absolutely <laughs> nobody surprised the war department decided that they were not going to officially recognize the Hyder campaign medal regardless Whatever. the entire unit is now being shipped back over to pennsylvania where they are going to have one month of advanced rifle marksmanship training despite the fact that most of them already qualified as expert so they go Oh, they do that they get even better at shooting them i know how that goes though really i went through basic training i did my ait my mos was 88 mike motor vehicle operator blah 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 i go through all that and then i get to my unit only to get to my unit and they're just like hey uh you need to uh, before you can drive that humvee before you can drive that mrap before you can drive that lhs before you can operate any one of these vehicles you need to get licensed on them and i was like but i just came from ait and they were like and i was like the whole purpose of that school was to get licensed on these vehicles i'm already licensed on these vehicles and you know what they said well you're not licensed with the 173rd you're retaking and relicensing on all of these vehicles and i'm just like so realistically i could have just gone to basic training and came straight here they were like well I mean, yeah, technically, but it's not the way it works. I was like, oh, okay, I get it. It's stupid. I just wasted eight weeks of my time doing something I was going to have to do twice. I got it. Cool. Nice. Y'all are phenomenal. Despite the fact that most of them already qualified as expert. So they go, they do that. They get even better at shooting than they already were. And then after that, the army comes out and they're like, hey, I've got this new sub. Reclassing on those, relicensing on those vehicles didn't make me a better driver than I already was, but... You know, with shooting, whatever, whatever. Zero temperature sleeping bag that I want to have tested. So we're going to take you guys, our guinea pig division. We're mm -hmm. going to send you over to West Virginia, have you go up in the mountains with this new sleeping bag. No tents, no fires. I just want you to live there for a month, hang out, freezing your ass off, and just sleep in these sleeping bags at night. And if you guys survive, we'll know they work, okay? We did that in Grafenveer. <clears throat> we did combat training up in the mountains of Germany. Uh, well, it wasn't really so much the mountains. We had to walk up to the fucking mountains. But yeah, Grafenveer, Germany, is, we essentially did that, but we didn't sleep outside. They had, like, hard-standing uh, buildings and structures uh, that were just that and only that. It had running water, kind of. No AC, no heat, no nothing. And when we went there, it was balls fucking cold. Uh, it didn't matter that we were inside of a building. We might as well have been sleeping outside. And we did 30 days of that. Yeah. I remember. Hey, good. See you in a month. Should I keep going? Why are you the way that you are? <laughs> so they go, they do that. They freeze their balls off for a month. They climb back down from the mountain. And the army's like, hey, guess what? It's uh, early 1944. We've decided that we don't need you guys for D-Day. You're not going to be going over to the European theater. Oh, bullshit. I did all this training. You bet your ass I'm going. I'd have been so mad. <laughs> I did all this, and I'm not even going to go get to fucking shoot at anybody? No, sir. I'd have been so upset. No. Man, hell no. Nah. You just used me as a guinea pig. We're one of the best ones, and you're not going to use our services? Man, nah. Nah. <laughs> I'd have been so upset. We're actually going to send you over to the Pacific to help out the Marine Corps. So, next step here. Okay, well, never mind. Maybe. Let's see training you're going to head over to virginia and you guys are going to train for a month doing amphibious landings in winter in the atlantic ocean but good news you're already cold so <laughs> have fun so they go they do that they crush it just like everything else they do now they're headed off to hawaii where they're going to go through jungle warfare training for six weeks now this is probably the most important training the 77th is going to get considering that they're going into war in the pacific theater up against the japanese in a jungle environment and the japanese mm -hmm. are presumably already masters of their own environment yes. and pretty much everybody in the 77th is hyper aware of this and it makes them take this chunk of training very that much seriously more serious and one of the things that they notice is when they show up to jungle warfare school there's 
the archway that they walk through. It says Jungle Warfare School, and it's got the tagline below it in quotes. It says, if they don't stink, stick them. Which is obviously referring to what you're supposed to do with your bayonet if you come across an enemy's corpse that isn't decomposing, because at this point in time, it was highly likely that that person wasn't actually dead. And they were playing dead, and when you walk past them, they shoot you in the fucking back. They were pretending to be yep. dead or hurt so that they could ambush you. And mm -hmm. I believe that's one of the big lessons that the 77th took to heart from this period of training for reasons that we're going to find out in a little bit. We didn't have bayonet. We didn't fix bayonets when I, when I deployed. Both times I deployed, I don't even think they issued us bayonets, to be honest. I mean, we had our own knives and blades. Um, we had... We had one psycho bastard that had a really big machete that he carried with him all the time because every unit has a bastard with a machete. Uh, we didn't have bayonets. So for us to do, we didn't really have to do this, but if we were put in a position where we had to do this, it would just be a quick little double tap. It wouldn't be sticking them. So they finished Jungle Warfare School and that's it. They're going off to war in the Pacific Theater after over two years of training in multiple different climates, in multiple different terrains all over. God, dude, two years of training. You know who does two years of training? Correct me if I'm wrong. Special Forces is the only... Today. Today. Special Forces. Two years of training. Or you know how much training I had? I had the nine weeks of basic. I had... For my first tour. I had the nine weeks of basic. I had the seven weeks of AIT. And then I had my combat training up in the mountains of Germany. That's it. I deployed. That's all I got. That's all the training your boy got. And then all of the other training was on the spot training and just trial by fire training. I learned a lot on mission. I learned a lot on foot patrols. I learned a lot on guard. Uh, I learned a lot on convoys. Uh, and it was just due to all of the sergeants and older enlisted that had already been to the country before that had already been to the country before and you know they they taught us they learned us some shit and stuff like that so and then for my my second tour i was already trained but you know we we did more combat training in california for the united states spanning over the course of two years this unit that is now on average 35 years old is headed to war so july 1944 they show up and they're <laughs> dude they're probably like fucking finally holy be helping the marine corps with the mariana islands campaign this is a marine corps operation they are running the show and the man in charge is the marine corps general holland howling mad smith and he has not been very impressed with the army's performance so far helping him with the first island in the mariana islands campaign saipan during the battle of saipan general smith was so unimpressed with the 27th id's performance that he actually had their general relieved of command and had a marine corps general placed in charge of an army division oh so my general god Smith is already not thinking very highly of the army's capabilities and when he finds out that he is being reinforced with the 77th ID a guinea pig unit that is comprised mostly of middle-aged men he probably gets even more pissed off he's not very happy mm -hmm. so they're getting ready to invade Guam and General Smith's plan is to not send in the 77th infantry division as a singular fighting unit he's gonna split them up and basically use them for reinforcements like if this unit over there lost a platoon he's just gonna take a platoon from Fillers. the 77th give it to those guys over there and he's basically gonna disband and piecemeal out the entire division is his plan and that's exactly what happens for the amphibious landing on Guam they take some of the 77th ID platoons they give them out to some of the Marine Corps units some of the other army divisions and they send him into battle. A couple days later, General Smith, wondering how the old guys are doing, writes out to his commanders like, hey, how are these old guys performing? Can we use more of them? What's the deal? And to They probably said, they're fucking incredible. Send the rest of them. <laughs> General Smith's surprise, according to all of his leaders in the field, these old dudes can throw down. They're absolutely yeah. awesome. A Marine Battalion commander even went so far as to say, and I quote, there is no doubt in our mind. That really is embarrassing though, having a Marine general come take the place of an army one for an army fucking unit. <laughs> oh man. Finds that the 77 Hold on, I gotta go back. Commander even went so far as to say, and I quote, there is no doubt in our minds that the 77th were good people to have alongside in a fight. As a result, we started referring to them as the 77th Marine Division. Okay, full stop. I need you guys to really appreciate what just got said here. Yeah. Hey, the Marine Corps, I love them, but they're not good at a whole lot. Really, <sighs> if I were the Commander in Chief, I wouldn't call up the Marine Corps unless I wanted something. The Marine Corps said they're so good at fighting, we're just going to call them Marines, really.
That's it. Y'all are Marines now. Y'all are so great. And dead, broken, or pregnant, that's really where they shine. That's their wheelhouse. You want to know what the Marines aren't good at? Giving compliments to other people. They're just, they're not about it, okay? So for the Marine Corps to look over at the 77th ID guys, a bunch of middle-aged army dudes killing people in battle. And say, y'all are one of us now? There's really no better compliment that you could get from the nation's finest. Battle and go... You're one of us. Yeah. That's the best compliment <laughs> yeah. the Marines know how to give, okay? Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge deal. Yeah. This is the equivalent of the Jedi Council giving you a seat on the Council and giving you the rank of Master. This mm -hmm. is unprecedented. Allow this appointment lightly. The Council does not. You're on this Council. We grant you the rank of Master. What? Take a seat, Master Skywalker. What? So when General Howling Mad Smith reads this, he's like, damn, okay, well, if one of my battalion commanders thinks that these are Marines... I'm going to treat them like Marines. I'm not piecing out the 77th Infantry Division one platoon at a time anymore. I'm going to send in the entire division send on the Marines' everyone. right flank. So pretty much immediately, the entire 77th Infantry Division is sent in, and they make an amphibious landing on the beach on the Marines' right flank. 15,000 middle-aged men from the East Coast <gasps> rolling up in amphibious tractors, getting out with M1 Grands and Tommy guns, ready to fuck shit up. This is the metaphorical equivalent of dad getting home from work, the Japanese just don't know it yet. And this amphibious landing and their movement up the beach and into battle was absolutely textbook. It's literally like, all right, we're here. Who needs killing? That guy? Okay, let's go, dudes. Let's try it out. That's, that's what that is, man. <laughs> it was the epitome of slow is smooth and smooth, smooth is fast. fast. It was the least chaotic amphibious landing anybody had ever seen. And as all this is going on, the Navy and some seagoing Marines are watching this amphibious landing take place, and a seagoing Marine famously says, would you look at those old bastards go, officially christening them with their new nickname, the old bastards. I like it. Now, the Battle of Guam rages on for about two more weeks until the island is secured on August 10th, 1944. And at the conclusion of this battle, it becomes clear to absolutely everyone, including General Howling Mad Smith, that his battalion commander was correct about the 77th Infantry Division. Because over the past two weeks of the Battle of Guam, the old bastards have racked up 2,741 confirmed kills and sustained only 248 in return. Damn. Okay, that is a ratio of 11 to 1 one going up against I was going to say a lot to a little a lot to a little but I'm glad he gave the numbers an enemy that has home field advantage and the luxury of playing defense from fortified machine gun positions which is absolutely insane yeah. and with a performance like that their new monikers of the old bastards and the 70 the enemy was like come and get me and the 77th was like okay bet <laughs> Wait right there. <laughs> Seventh Marines are pretty much set in stone with even General Holland Howling Mad Smith himself referring to them as such. Because of their incredible performance at Guam, they are then given some rest and relax. Look at me. This island belongs to me now. <laughs> Relaxation in New Caledonia. This is my so island they now. They hop in the boats and head there immediately. They get about halfway there and then the big green weenie strikes. Change of plans. No more R&R. &R. We're going to turn the boats around and head straight over to the Philippines because in Leyte, MacArthur has four divisions and they are completely stalled out and they need the old bastard's help. Now, the Japanese government has pretty much come out and said that they are going to make the Battle of Leyte a decisive battle for this war. And for mm -hmm. that reason, they are throwing all the resources and manpower they have Naturally. to win this battle against America and not lose this island. And up until this point, they're doing a great job. And then the 77th showed up. They show up to Leyte Thanksgiving Day 1944 with the energy of dad didn't get to take his nap and now it's going to be fucking everybody's problem. Okay, <laughs> oversimplified version of what's going on here. The Americans no. have one half of the island. The Japanese have the other. The Americans are getting resupplied on their back end and the Japanese are getting resupplied on their back end from a place called Ormok Bay. So the 77th Infantry is like, that's fine. Hear me out. We'll hop in the boats. We'll drive around Leyte, make an amphibious landing and we'll take over Ormok Bay, cut off their supplies game over we win to which the chain of command is like that's absolutely crazy you're going to be outnumbered three to one and we're not going to be able to get you any more supplies to which the 77th is that's like that's fine that's fine we'll just bring some supplies with us and then we'll steal all the enemy shit and as far as being outnumbered three to one we've been hanging out with the marines this entire time yeah and if they've taught us anything that's just a target rich environment yeah. let's fucking run it so fast forward a couple I love of days it. december 7th the 77th <laughs> I love it. id makes an amphibious landing in ormok bay they catch the japanese completely off guard take over the entire thing Thing, get their entire division into the bay in 35 minutes then they start bringing in artillery and m10 tank destroyers so 
the entire division in 35 minutes, guys. Maybe, maybe Fat Electrician's not going to make a big deal about that, but I am. That's impressive. That's... Holy shit. L look up the definition of efficiency in the fucking dictionary. You'll see this amphibious landing. Good lord. Guard, take over the entire thing, get their entire division into the bay in 35 minutes. Then they start bringing in artillery and M10 tank destroyers. So they get everything squared away. They establish a defensive perimeter, also known as a beachhead. Then first thing tomorrow, bright and early, they're going to start kicking ass, right? Right. Everything's great. Couple hours later, guess who shows up? A Japanese landing ship full of Japanese troops not having gotten the memo that America runs Ormok Bay now. Ooh. So two bastards under the cover of night aim all of the artillery and the M10 tank destroyer at this ship as it gets closer and closer, getting ready to offload its barges full of troops and more supplies. The ship gets as close as it's gonna get, it sends out its first barge, and the old bastards just wait patiently as the barge gets closer and closer. And as it gets within 50 feet of them, they open fire with the 50 caliber machine guns, pretty much sinking it immediately. As the man on top of the M10 tank destroyer yells out, Get some flares in the air so I can hit these sons of bitches. As the flares get shot up, the enemy ship is illuminated as the artillery and the M10 open fire on it, sinking it in a matter of minutes. According to the 77th ID's unit historian, this is believed to be the only time in World War II history where an infantry unit has successfully sunk an enemy naval vessel. So they're already off to a great start, and what happens next is described by an observer from the- I wonder why this ship didn't get the memo. Did someone forget? to give this ship the memo? Or was it done on purpose? Like, hey, I think we're on the verge of losing this bay. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's see what kind of firepower they have. Let's see what they're working with. Let's see what we're up against. Let's just not tell this ship. But then again, how would they even know? This ship probably got sunk extraordinarily fast. Probably didn't even have a chance to communicate with higher-ups. It's probably just a mistake, really, but... One could say they probably just didn't inform them on purpose just to see the climate of, you know, I don't know the War Department as a divisional epic. Over the course of the next eight weeks, the 77th goes on an absolute rampage, taking over three cities, an airfield, and securing 43 miles of main supply chain roads. Damn. Okay? It's not a big island. There's not that many roads. They've basically taken over all of them. Everything. And the entire time they're doing this, they are acquiring enemy supplies. Everything from food to vehicles, and anything they don't use, they destroy. And they're not just out there stealing all the enemy shit. They're out there giving out death certificates like their Oprah Winfrey giving out cars <laughs> because during this period they are credited with 19,456 confirmed kills. Good in return God. they suffered 543 Americans killed in action. That's a lot. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way but it needs to be said that that is a 36 to 1 ratio. Yeah. Okay, 19, 000... Listen, it's combat. People are gonna die but when you only lose 500 as sad as those deaths probably were and thank you to them and their families for their service and their sacrifice. I mean, goddamn, bro, that's that's fucking incredible. Really? to 500 is an ass whooping and a half. Yeah. And this would be studied at Fort Benning by the Advanced Officers Training Program for the next 40 years. When did this video come out? Five days ago, thank you for calling it Fort Benning and not that stupid-ass bullshit that they named it to. I can't even remember what it got named to, but I will always call it Fort Benning. I will always refer to it as Fort Benning. I will never call it as anything else. Why? Because someone's vagina hurts? Nah. Nah. Thank you for calling it Fort Benning. I appreciate it. I pretty much grew up there would be studied at Fort Benning by the Advanced Officers Training Program for the next 40 years on how to conduct a clinical, textbook-level ass-whooping. This two-month-long rampage would bring an end to the Battle of Leyte with America securing the island, and the 77th would immediately be shipped over to begin preparations for the Battle of Okinawa.
Kamikaze so boats. The staging area for the Battle of Okinawa, at which point they are informed that there is a small island chain known as the Karamaretto Islands. It is 15 miles off the coast of Okinawa, and the chain of command believes that they are going to be of strategic importance, and the 77th has to go clear them out. Now, the Karamaretto Islands is made up of four main islands, and the old bastards decide that they're going to take all four of them at once because apparently they're in a hurry. So that's what they do. They launch an amphibious landing on all four islands at the exact same time. Some of the islands they take over with zero resistance whatsoever whatsoever, and the other islands, they face very, very little resistance. And for a second, it was so easy that they were kind of thinking maybe they just wasted a bunch of time and resources capturing these islands anyways, but upon further investigation, what they found was a fleet of 360 hastily made boats that were filled to the brim with explosives that oh. the Japanese were going to use in a kamikaze style attack, but instead of planes, they were going to be driving explosive uh. boats directly into American ships during the main invasion of Okinawa. So being able to prevent the enemy from using these weapons during the invasion of Okinawa made this entire mission completely worth it. They got a... They basically just found free supplies that they can use at will in the future. Fast forward a couple of days, April 1st, 1945, Easter Sunday, the Battle of Okinawa begins. It is two Marine divisions and four Army divisions making the initial landing, and the 77th is not one of them. They are being held back in reserve. And just to be clear, they're not being held in reserve because the chain of command thinks that they're the second string backup guys. They're being held in reserve because they have the reputation of being the problem solvers, and they want to save the 77th until they diagnose where the real problem's at, and they're going to send the 77th in then. Pretty mm -hmm. much immediately after the invasion of Okinawa, it becomes very clear to the chain of command that they- It's like giving Michael Jordan the day off, but he might come in in the fourth quarter if it starts slipping away. Missed a nearby airfield. There is a small- Wait, hold on. I got to go back. Real problems at, and they're going to send the 77th in then. Pretty much immediately after the invasion of Okinawa, it becomes very clear to the chain of command that they missed a nearby airfield. There is a small island neighboring Okinawa known as Lishima, and on that island, there is a Japanese airfield, and that airfield needs to go away. Hmm. Problem is, that airfield is being guarded by 5,000 Japanese soldiers that are very well dug in, and they are not about to give up without a fight. Mm -hmm. So... They send in the 77th. There you the go. old bastards make quick work of it, securing the entire island of Lishima in six days with none of the Japanese willing to surrender. Virtually all of them were killed in combat, approximately 5,000 enemy soldiers, with the 77th losing 258 men in return. Good and Lord, while the old bastards dude. are securing Lishima, the Battle of Okinawa is still raging on. It is one of the bloodiest, most hard fought battles in American history. The island is being guarded by over 100,000 Japanese soldiers with hundreds of heavy artillery. Yeah, I'm telling you, man, th those two years of training as excruciating and as grueling as it probably was and i was even talking shit earlier like fuck no man let me just go fight it really did pay off pieces thousands of mortar positions and fortified machine gun positions they have the high ground and they have underground tunnel networks this entire battle is a fucking meat grinder the entire island of okinawa is an enormous problem and nobody is having a good time but one of the most problematic areas is a hundred foot high cliff face where the 96th infantry division has been absolutely shredded this place is known as the escarpment or as it would later become known as hacksaw ridge the old bastards are being sent in to do what the 96th Infantry Division couldn't pull off. As they show up, they send two battalions up the 100-foot-high cliff face to engage the enemy. The Japanese drove both battalions back, forcing all of them to retreat. All of them, except for one. One of the youngest old bastards, a 26-year-old medic by the name of Desmond Doss, who was unique in that he refused to carry a weapon into battle because mm -hmm. he was a conscientious objector that didn't want to hurt anybody, he only wanted to save people. He stayed up top while everybody else retreated, and while evading the enemy, he managed to go around and find wounded Americans and begin lowering them down the cliff face all through the remainder of that day and all through the night. By the next morning, he had single-handedly lowered 75 men down a 100-foot cliff face, saving all of them. The next day, the 77th would attack again, this time sending up one battalion to engage the enemy and the other battalion out and around the side to flank Blank. them. During this battle, Desmond Doss would become mortally wounded by grenade shrapnel and sniper fire. While wounded, he continued to insist that the other medics and litter bearers continue to save other men rather than himself. The old bastards would finally take the ridge, killing over 3,500 Japanese soldiers Damn. and losing over 600 men of their own. But amongst them 
was not Desmond Doss. The men of the 77th got Doss evacuated in time. He would survive and eventually go on to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at Hacksaw Ridge. But as his journey in World War II came to an end, the old bastard still had work to do. Now the 77th- For the record, you guys, I started watching Hacksaw Ridge. I rented it on YouTube. It was like 2.30 in the morning. Started watching it. I got like, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes in and then I fell asleep and then completely forgot about it. And then my rental expired. And then I just completely forgot about it in general. I will finish it one of these days, but I do know of Desmond. I've watched several videos on Desmond before. I know the story. Uh, but as far as the, this is something that I didn't know that he was attached to the 77th. It's going to be sent to capture Shiri Castle, but in order to do that, they have to punch through the Shiri line, which is essentially a natural wall of hills and cliffs. And on top of them is 50,000 Japanese soldiers manning fortified machine gun positions with overlapping fields of fire. At this point, almost all of the American forces are stopped in their tracks somewhere along this line. Two Marine divisions and another Army division, both stuck, unable to penetrate through. The spot where the 77th have to break through to get to Shiri Castle is approximately half a mile wide and two miles in length. It takes them 32 days of constant fighting Damn. to clear that two miles. During those 32 days and in that single plot of land, the Japanese forces suffered 14,000 men killed in action. All of the American divisions managed to break through the Shiri line around the same time and the Battle of Okinawa would rage on for a little bit longer, but the Shiri line breaking was the last major defensive maneuver that the Japanese were able to do. Everything after that was small scale skirmishes and this would rapidly bring about an end to the Battle of Okinawa. After Okinawa had been secured, the 77th would receive word that they are to be shipped back to the Philippines where they are going to be retooled, refitted, and receive a bunch of new guys to replace the men that they had lost and they are going to be the only combat unit that was present in the Battle of Okinawa that is also to partake in the first wave of the invasion of mainland Japan. Which is probably the shittiest compliment imaginable Hey, you guys did such a great job that you get to do it again. Luckily, however- Yo, Sara, what's going on, man? How are you? Hopefully you're having a, a good week, a solid Thursday. Glad you're here. After arriving to the Philippine island of Cebu, the 77th ID would receive word that America had utilized a new type of weapon by dropping an atomic bomb hmm. on Hiroshima and Nagasaki forcing the Japanese to surrender and they would not have to go and invade the mainland of Japan. This is terrific news, but it left just one thing the 77th ID had to do before they could finally go back home. You see, all throughout the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and the rest of the Pacific, there were still Japanese military members all over the place, scattered pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. Many of these groups Fractured, of Japanese soldiers would refuse to surrender for months, or in some cases, even years or decades, refusing to believe that the Japanese Empire would ever surrender. And in the case of Cebu, where get the 77th the currently were, up in the mountains, there were approximately 5,500 Japanese soldiers. Fortunately, they were willing to surrender because they got orders directly from the emperor. Unfortunately, they were willing to surrender to literally anybody except for the old bastards. Bear in mind, we're back in the Philippines. These Japanese soldiers hiding up in the mountains in Cebu are the remnants of what was left after the Battle of Leyte yeah. when the 77th went on a two month long rampage destroying everything. Now, to be fair, we don't know for sure why these guys were willing to surrender to literally anybody except for the old bastards. Well, because the old bastards were pretty much making a joke out of the Japanese military. And they felt a certain kind of way about it. Kind of like, you know, the entire fucking NFL felt a certain kind of way about the fucking Patriots winning Super Bowl after Super Bowl after Super Bowl. You know what? I I'll lose to the Lions. I'll lose to the Falcons. I'll lose to the Packers. We're just not losing to the goddamn Patriots. Fuck that team, right? It's kind of like that. Like, these guys are just, yeah, fuck those guys. They've been, they've been making us look bad. They gave us such a hard time. Fuck those dudes. It's probably what they're saying. Maybe it was because they remembered a bunch of middle-aged men with a blue Statue of Liberty patch on mm -hmm. their shoulder whooping their ass, and they just didn't want to surrender to them. Mm -hmm. Or, I, I have a... I have an alternative theory. You see, along this entire journey, the 77th has not only gained a reputation for being extremely effective in combat, but they've also gained a reputation for 
kind of, sort of, not really taken a whole lot of prisoners compared to everybody else. Ruthless. Now, bear in mind, this is the Imperial Japanese. Not many of these guys got taken as prisoner because they would rather die in combat than lose their honor by surrendering. Despite that, out of all the POWs that were taken, the 77th somehow managed to take on the least. You know what? Let me just read you guys the stats and you can come to your own. Of course. They play the victim. They were ruthless. They killed everybody. They didn't want to take prisoners. I even dropped my gun and everything, and they still shot us. Says the motherfuckers that did a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Really? You're going to complain? You're going to bitch about that? It's combat, bro. Get over it. Conclusions. For all of the Pacific theater across all branches of the U.S. military, approximately 50,000 Japanese POWs were taken. That is a ratio of 44 to 1. For every 45 enemy soldiers that the American forces came up against, 44 of them were killed in action and one was taken prisoner. The 77th Infantry Division, on the other hand, only managed to take 358 POWs, which is a ratio of 122 to one. And it gets way worse if you want to talk about the Battle of Okinawa in particular. During the Battle of Okinawa, all of the U.S. forces combined took a total of 10,801 Japanese prisoners of war. That is a 10 to 1 ratio. Of those 10,801 POWs taken by the U.S. forces at the Battle of Okinawa, the 77th ID was responsible for 58 of them <laughs> at a ratio of 278 to 1 compared to the U.S. Armed Forces... We surrender. We surrender. I don't give a shit. You're dying right now. <laughs> you can surrender all day. Doesn't matter. You die right here, right now. Ratio of 10 to 1. Okay, now to be completely honest, I have no idea why it's like that. Perhaps it's because the old bastards displayed exceptional rifle marksmanship. Maybe it's the fact that they took the jungle warfare lesson of if they don't stink, stick them to heart. And they followed through with that throughout the entire war. Either way, the fact of the matter is they've developed the reputation that they don't really take prisoners. And now there's 5,500. Taking prisoners slows you down. And then you got to feed them. You got to house them. You got to do all of this fucking humane shit. And at the end of the day, it's combat. None of it is humane. Kill him. That's it. I would expect the same thing from my enemy. Just kill me. That's it. 100 Japanese soldiers hiding up in the mountains that are too scared to surrender to the 77th ID. And they need them. Oh, to that's why they were afraid. They were like, no, we're not going to surrender to them. Because if we surrendered, if we surrender to them, they're just going to pull a fucking Frank Castle on us and still kill us anyways. Yeah, yeah, could have been that too. Surrender so that they can finally go home and mow their lawn after like four years. <laughs> they always start before everyone wakes up, including roosters. What the? Hey, shut up! You shut up! So the leadership of the 77th sends it up the chain of command. Hey, you're going to have to get some other unit out here to accept this surrender because they're willing to surrender to anybody except for us. To which the big army is like, just fucking figure it out. No, I'm not sending another group of guys out there. Get them to surrender one way or the other. Make it happen. Chop, chop. Hurry up. Now, the obvious answer is to just practice classic American diplomacy where you show up with a gun and a sandwich and ask them which one they would prefer <laughs> and let them know that both is an option. The old bastards, on the other hand, have an even better idea. They are going to close this saga out the same way they opened it up by pulling some schoolyard bullshit and tomfoolery. So here's what they come up with. A lot of the new reinforcements that they were getting weren't old guys anymore. It was just whoever the army had. So it was 18, 19, 20 year old kids. So they took them, had had them take the blue Statue of Liberty 77th ID patches off their uniform and they're going to send them up the mountain, have the Japanese surrender to them, separate them from their guns right there and march them down the mountain. So that's exactly what happens. They start marching the Japanese down the mountain. Japanese are happy because they've gotten to surrender to literally anybody except the old guys with the blue Statue of Liberty patch. Please tell me that when they got back down the mountain, they were like, they were like oh, by the way, we're the 77th. Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> on their shoulder and then they get to the bottom of the mountain where there's a bunch of old guys with the statue of liberty patch on their shoulder so the japanese promptly so shift good the pants, <laughs> to die, at which point the 77th is like look calm down we don't we don't care we're not gonna hurt you i just need you guys to get on the boats so we can ship you off to wherever the yeah. army wants you so that we can then get on our boats and we can go home because we're sick of this shit mm -hmm. that's what happens that's it the 77th goes back home the unit gets deactivated and everybody lives happily ever after so in conclusion that is the story of the 77th infantry division aka that was good the old bastards a bunch of middle-aged men originally seen as nothing more than a bunch of guinea pigs who's only meaningful and this pretty much translates i feel to modern times bro really 
think about it. For anyone in here who was in the service, for anyone in the comment section who was in the service, how, or, how old were you when you joined? Like me, you were probably 18, 19 years old. How old were your drill sergeants? 30, 28, 29, 35 in some cases, right? Kind of just translates, man. Uh, you're, today, I don't want to say it's impossible, but you're never going to see a 21-year-old drill sergeant, man, rarely, maybe. I don't know, but when I was in basic training, all of my drill sergeants, bro, they were over the age of 30, or at the very least, 30. They were. I could tell in their face. I could tell in the way I wasn't going to ask. But one of my drill sergeants, I did know I did know his age. He was 35, and in his previous life, before he joined the service, he was a postman. Yeah, he was a postal worker. And so most of my drill sergeants were of just middle age, man, 30, 35. So it kind of just like from here on out, it kind of just like translated very, very easy. And maybe, maybe you have a really high speed soldier that just joined at 17 with parental consent. And then he was just super high speed, Captain America type, rose up in the ranks really, really quickly. Bing, bang, boom, became a drill sergeant at the very young age of 22, 23. However, I don't know about you guys, but my basic training, my drill sergeants were of the same age as the old bastards. Full contribution to the war effort could be to collect data points and run experiments on that would somehow go yeah. on to become one of the most effective- That's it, 18 and my drill instructors were around 28 to 35, same fighting forces the world had ever seen. They saw combat in the Pacific Theater for 11 months, and during that time, they would lose 2,100 men. But for every old bastard that fell on the battlefield, he would take with him 22 enemies. The 77th was credited with 43,650. All these dudes had, all these dudes had fantastic KD ratios. I'll tell you that, man. One confirmed kills during this time period. Hold on, I gotta go back, because he probably just said it bastard that fell on the battlefield he would take with him 22 enemies the 77th was credited with 43,651 confirmed kills during this time period they were the busiest army division in the pacific theater and they were the only army division that was declared to be marines, marines. by the marine corps <laughs> for this the members of the 77th were awarded six medals of honor Ugh. 19 distinguished service crosses two distinguished service medals 335 silver stars, 22 legions of merit, 25 soldier medals, 4,433 bronze stars, and 16 distinguished unit citations. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go. This unit is full of fucking heroes. Buy some merch over the Fat Electrician. Good Latin. lord. Quack bang out. Yo, this one's going to be kind of a bitch to edit. Seriously, this is one of the best stories and one of the funnest things that but I've I'm ever uploading done to research. It. That being said, for some reason, once I found out that pretty much all these guys were from the East Coast, the only thing I could picture in my head was that all 15,000 of these dudes were rich high. You know, angry cops. <laughs> it's one of the most terrifying thoughts I've ever had in my entire life. Just 15,000 angry drill sergeants storming up. Yeah. <laughs> 15,000. Man, when I was in basic training, I was just simply afraid of one drill sergeant. 15,000 of these old dudes that, for all intents and purposes, their body hurts. Th their body probably already hurt before they joined the service, right? And then they're having to go out here, deal with some young, fuck, deal with some young ass kids, deal with the spunky Japanese, and they're like, okay. Dude, I, we're, we're, we're gonna make this efficient. We're gonna uh, we're gonna do this quickly, cause like Fat Electrician said, I gotta get back home. No one's cutting the grass. My car needs a new carburetor. Maybe some new airs in the, maybe some new air, maybe some air in the tires. I got shit to do back home, man. Let's get this done, and that's efficiency, dog. Holy, that was a fun one. That one's going to be uh, tricky to, it's not going to be tricky, it's going to be tedious. But really what I might do is I just might, I might cut out all of the commercials that we had and just call it a day and let it just fucking run. It'll probably be like an hour video since this was already 41 minutes. 
But this was actually this was actually a, a fun story to listen to. Uh, let me uh, let me just see some of the comments. Uh, huge thank you to Jim. Hmm, hold on, this one, this one. S huge thank you to Jim Skyaretta, Skyaretta, son of the seventy seventh ID veteran who helped tremendously with the research for this video. Links to his father's memoirs and the book "Ours to Hold High" are in the description above. If anyone is interested. Someone said, I was teaching my wife firearm safety and we were talking guns in general. She was asking me about suppressors and I couldn't remember the term threaded barrel. So she said ribbed for her silence. <laughs> it might be the greatest thing I've ever heard. Someone said, uh, we had a 34 year old during basic training and he was a great dude. Uh, he was pre rated for air traffic. He was pre rated for air traffic controller. He failed a hearing test or he failed a hearing check and they wanted to switch his job rating. The whole division took their shirts off and threw them in a pile as protest. I had never heard of a division doing anything like that during basic training. And I'm sure we paid for it later but the moral of the story is he ended up getting to retake the test he passed the test and kept his rating it was a victory for all of us and one of the coolest signs of loyalty i've ever seen considering the rest of us were closer to 19 years old at the time yeah i i'm telling you man there was a 40 year old in our basic training and nice guy man super nice guy and uh he was just he was kind of just like the dad of the uh he was older than our drill sergeants man he was kind of just like the dad of our platoon dude he was very very quick to pick up on things very very fast learner like like he needed any kind of learning or training to begin with he was a police officer for 20 fucking years which was just unheard of to me man i was just like you could have done anything but the second half of your life and instead you decided to join the service and quite possibly be the oldest private that I think I've ever encountered, which was just kind of like mind boggling to me. Even the drill sergeants were having a hard time understanding this guy. Like, you, you're a cop for 20 years and now you're here? What's the matter with you, man? What, what are you doing? But hey. <clears throat> The old bastards channeling get off my lawn into get off my island since 1942. Yeah, pretty much. I was prior service Navy in the early 90s. 2003 comes around and I joined the Army. I was 30 years old and the drill sergeants were all at least three years younger. They knew not to fuck around so hard with us after I was told to drop forever. Push-ups until you die. Yeah, for the uninitiated. Or push the fucking earth into a different orbit. That's one of my drill sergeants said that one time. I want you to push us out of fucking orbit, private. I want you to make the wall sweat. Oof, that was rough. That was a rough day. And I proceeded to call out one ever, two ever, three ever, four ever. After my reps... The look on that dude's face when I looked up at him from the ground when I requested permission to recover. I had better mind games than they did. <laughs> yeah, it uh, it really is hard to, like, someone of that age, 30 and up in basic training, it really is hard to break them mentally. And most of the people that are going to be in basic training are just 18, 19-year-old kids. Most of them you can break. Most of them, you can you can do that. With the older guys, it's it's hard to break them that way. You have to figure out other methods and different tactics to you know. And for the most part, you know, someone of that age really isn't going to be a problem in basic training. They're not going to fuck around. They're not going to be jackasses like you know the the younger guys and stuff like that. They're all they're all full of 
stupid shit, really, for the most part. Old men have a fuck you mentality as well. They do. Not scared of shit or death, which I remind people in Sun Tzu's Art of War. If you enter a battle trying to live, you will die. If you enter the battle ready to die, you may live. Exactly. Someone said, my great-grandfather was in the 77th Staff Sergeant Russell J. Scott, 77th Infantry Division, 307th Infantry Regiment Company. He entered combat in Guam and finished on Okinawa. He got out in December of 1945. During the war, he almost lost his life twice that I know of. That's just what he's told you. Uh, he was in the middle of digging his foxhole when a Japanese artillery bombardment truck... Hold on. When a, when an artillery bombardment struck. IDF. A shell landed near him, and the shock from it... Shell shock. Knocked the shovel out of his hand. When he found it, he only found the handle. Jesus. He spent the rest of that bombardment in a shallow foxhole. I don't know where the second time was, but I know it was in a rice paddy, which doesn't really know it down. Him and another soldier were scouting, and they, and they got caught in the middle of the rice paddy by Japanese machine guns. They couldn't move at all because the Japanese shot at even the tiniest of movements. So even if the wind blew, they were fucking probably shooting in that direction. Uh, because of that, he couldn't get. Because of that, he couldn't get. He couldn't get to his rifle. A couple typos here. Uh, and that's from his side. He counted seven bullet holes in the side of it. Uh, that refurbished M1903 saved his life by simply sitting by his side. Jesus. When I look at ours to hold high a while back, I remember looking at the casualties across the 77th. The 307th Infantry had the highest out of every regiment attached to the 77th. Ah, damn. Division had a lot of fucking awards. And for good reason. <sighs> and they were well earned. So, I guess my favorite statistic that I heard and that I'm going to take away from this video is the low POW count. We don't have time to be carrying your ass. We're just going to shoot you dead. That's it. That's the way it should be. Unless you capture someone... Unless you come across someone of, like, high rank, then you take that motherfucker, see if you can break him mentally so that he spills information, and then just kill him afterwards. But still, that's, like, my favorite statistic piece of information from this. These were all, were all badass dudes. It's like, when a, it's like when a mom is telling her child to do something, and the child doesn't want to do it, and the, mom, and the mom says, Do I need to go get your father? And the kid straightens up real quick, real quick and in a hurry. Those were these guys. Those were these dads right there. Do I need to go get your father? No, no, you don't. I'm fine. I'm good. Those were, those were these guys. I got to go eat, hang out, with, uh, hang out with my niece. My dad is visiting until Monday. He's going to be here until Monday, and then he flies back to Georgia. So I'm going to go hang out with the old man. Maybe see if, now that I watch this, Maybe see if I can go pry any more war stories out of him. He doesn't tell me shit. Like, at all. Motherfucker was in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, the Gulf War. And the amount of stories that I get from him... So either he doesn't want to talk about it, or he didn't do anything. Or he didn't see anything. I doubt he didn't see anything. So... I'm going to go ask him again, bug him about it. Who knows? But, you know, you have to respect a soldier and a veteran's choice to not speak about the things that they d did or speak about the things that they saw. However, you never really, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure if y'all have any parents or something like that that are in the service, they probably don't tell you shit either. And I'm the same way. There's, there's certain stories, there's certain things that I did and saw that I haven't even told you guys. And I tell y'all a lot. So, I get it, but god damn it, hook me up, dad. Just a little fucking bit, man.